Hello, I'm Rachel. Um, this is my company, Edge, and um, I'm a landscape architect by trade and an urban designer. Um, I've been growing food all my life, um, but I've been doing it professionally for about 10 years. Um, so I was very lucky to have grandparents in Jersey as I was growing up, and so my summers involved digging up Jersey Royals, and I hate this time of year because no Jersey Royal would ever taste the same to my grand grandpa's. Um, but uh, yeah, just not the same in the shops, but, um, but they grew everything on, on their plot, to, and chickens, bees and all of that, and, and that obviously got into my blood. And it took me a while to realise it, um, until I ended up living in Todmorden, which is in Yorkshire. Uh, anybody heard of Incredible Edible, Todmorden? I think so, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Uh, so for those of you that might not know, Incredible Edible is a, is a grassroots movement about growing food in public spaces. Um, using kind of spare, spare land, if you like, un un unclaimed land. Um, and it's about kind of educating people around food, growing food together, bringing people together around food, uh, building communities around that. It started in Tottenham about mm, between 15, 20 years ago now. So it's, it's quite an old project now. And there's incredible edibles all over the place. There's an incredible edible Hong Kong, it's taken off in France, it, 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 all over, and, and in this country too. Um, and so basically, they just started growing food in the town. I don't know, if it's a bit light in here, isn't it? But there's some sweet corn and, and veg growing in raised beds there outside the police station. When the police station got beds, the fire station went, hang on a minute, we want some raised beds outside ours. So, you know, and, that, and that's literally on one of the main streets in the town. So um, it's just kind of created this real foodie place uh, where people visit to, to kind of see what's happening and, and see all the growing. Um, and this is another example of their health centre, which was new since the start of the project. And this is fruit trees, fruit shrubs and rhubarb, kind of layered planting. Um, uh, just in the car park there at the, at the health centre. So, so what they've done in the town is they've made sure that all new planting that goes in is edible. And they've done a lot around kind of legislation of planting in public spaces. They've got growing into all the schools in the town. Um, so teaching every single children about growing food um, and having quite a large impact in terms of how people are thinking about food, particularly buying local. Uh, so when I came back, so I lived in Tottenham for five years, and when I came back to Oxford, uh, I set up Incredible Edible Oxford, which is now called Edge, so it's the same organisation, and that was ten years ago now. And we started by, by growing in one of the parks in East Oxford, and then uh, as part of that project, we set up a, a forest garden. People familiar with the term forest garden? Mm -hmm. Can you say a bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so basically, if you think about how a woodland grows, I mean, you just look out there, you've got lots of plants side by side, growing underneath each other, trees, shrubs, ground covers. Uh, there's no bare soil in, in nature. And basically, a forest garden is replicating how nature grows um, for, for some kind of productive planting. So it's not necessarily food, it could be biodiverse planting, it could be uh, for timber, it could be for medicinal plants, it doesn't have to be food, but quite often it's, it's food. Um, so this was planting day, this is me, I was a bit thinner then, that was before lockdown. Um, and we planted in trees, shrubs, um, all of this you can't really see, but all of these here are tiny little hazel whips, quite small, um, it was quite a wet land. Uh, it's just at the tip of this grass here, between two pathways, under about that much water every winter. It's a quite a wet site. The council didn't really want to, you know, they weren't bothered about it. So we've got a good relationship with Oxford City Council. Got that piece of land. And this is it about four years later. Um, so this is all hazel here that you can see. It started like that. Um, and the hazel has had a huge impact on um, the wet, so now that site isn't wet in winter. So hazel's an amazing productive shrub uh, that can help uh, alleviate wet, uh, wet areas. Um, but it likes having wet feet, so it also works in, in wetlands. This is one of the fruit trees we planted, that's a plum. Um, and that, that's just free for people to help themselves to, basically. That's just part of the kind of incredible edible model. So we don't make any money from that. Uh, it's our main area of planting. We use it for teaching, we run courses there. A, a laser pointer on the very top of that thing you're holding if you want to. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. 
Uh, so part of my area of work is in urban areas uh, because I think it's quite easy if, if one can have an acre, five acres, ten acres, grow, grow your own food. Um, I'm not suggesting it's easy, by the way. Uh, but uh, that's one way of growing food. And uh, there's lots of people that live in an urban environment that can't have acres and acres. And there's lots of people that live in much more densely populated areas. So for me, part of the excitement about food production is within urban areas. And I just wanted to show you some examples, really, of ones that I really like. So this one, anybody know, know any of these, by the way? Do you recognise any of the pictures? Seen any of them before? Is this, no. the of Milan, this is Milan, yes, exactly, oh, yeah. This is the Bosco Verticale building in, in Milan. It's a block of flats. And as you can see, there's lots of balconies, and they're all greened with trees and shrubs. Does, um, it, does it look like that in the Of course. <laughs> uh, but you could plant evergreens. Um, so this is this is kind of unproductive planting, so not edible. Um, but of course, it's helping you know, air quality. It's helping the people that live inside. It's 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 helping um, having access to green and nature. Uh, this one is a rooftop uh, productive farm in New York. It's called Brooklyn Grange Farm, um, and that's one. There's a CSA, so that's kind of a community model of, of a veg garden. This one is in Munich, sheep on the roof. Uh, there's also bees and chickens on there. Um, again, that's mainly for education rather than kind of volumes of food production. Um, and this one here is in Reading, so that's the closest one. Um, and that's a forest garden on a rooftop. And it's all planted in a foot of soil. Um, and it's done as part of a leaky roof, flat roof strategy. Um, because the, the roof is leaking, I don't think you can't really see, but there's buildings there. <coughs> This is about three floors up um, in the centre of Reading. And you can see that some of the, the planting is very mature. There's a tree there. This is a strawberry tree here. Produces quite nice fruits. So that's again used for education, um, but it's a really good example of a mature forest garden. It's about 20 years old. Um, and as part of that work, I've developed a toolkit, which is specifically for urban food production. And I'm not here to sell the toolkit today, but just to say, that's okay. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Drink some email if you can help. Um, because there's a lot of urban designers and landscape architects out there that don't know anything about food production, and really we want to help try and get more food growing in the public landscape. So that, that's kind of some of our work. Other areas of my work include market gardens. Uh, so market gardens is the language that's being used a lot at the moment around food production um, for kind of commercial and veg box schemes. Uh, so so a lot of my week is taken up by visiting market gardens, helping them grow as a business, um, expand what they're growing, train, tra train growers, um, help them you know, increase their bottom line essentially and, and become a bit more productive. Um, so I've just got some examples here. Uh, so it could be a, a veg box scheme, something like this. It could be an honesty box shed or something like this. Um, it could be um, selling only to wholesale, to, to shops, to caterers, things like that. Um, you know, obviously you can incorporate chickens um, or eggs and other produce and, and of course chickens help manage the land. Uh, so at the moment I'm working in uh, all of those counties on market gardens uh, and every week we're getting calls from people that want to set up a new market garden or, or um, are running one and want to kind of make, it, make it a bit more efficient. Uh, so, how is it that I grow food differently? Well, I use these kind of methods, I guess. So, everything we do is no dig, mainly because it's just a job that we can do without, so nobody needs to turn over the soil. We also don't compact the soil, so anywhere where we're producing plants isn't stepped on or driven on. We use a lot of perennials, plants that come back year on year. Um, and we plant in polycultures, so exactly like you see kind of out there in, in the more wild areas, lots of different plants growing together uh, because it's not natural for nature to grow in monocultures, generally. And by doing that, we're building an ecosystem and we're building the soil. And this is just a picture of the soil food web um, because that's what we're trying to protect. And what happens in compaction, which I'm sure you know, is that it means uh, water doesn't get through, but also roots can't get through. So in uncompacted soil, you get a much better and healthier 
uh, soil structure and roots can, can uh, grow through. And uh, this is an example of an experiment that I did four different rows, wood chip, manure, wood chip and manure, and uh, nothing. And uh, you can see this is the one we're both on. Actually, the wood chip was the best producing, and that was with uh, purple sprouting and broccoli, uh, sorry, purple sprouting and lettuce. Uh, that was growing in all these four ways. Um, so that was just for a bit of fun, really. But, uh, so we're always adding material on top rather than digging down into the, into the soil. Uh, I mentioned the ecosystem in the soil. Uh, we also want to protect the worms. So there are three main types of earthworm here in the UK. Uh, about 60 different varieties. So we have ones that live on the surface, worms that shallow burrow, and worms that deep burrow. So, kind of like this, channels. And every time we're putting a, a spade or a fork into the ground, it's messing up that bare ecosystem. So that's one of the reasons why we don't dig. Uh, but also we want to keep the fungi networks alive and working. So fungus and fungi networks, which this is part of, work hard under, under the ground, transporting nutrients between plants, exchanging good and bad nutrients, um, feeding them, uh, keeping the soil alive and keeping the bacteria, etc. All part of the soil ecosystem. And again, that's another reason why we don't dig and we're always building up the soil. Uh, so we always use mulches. Anywhere where there isn't a plant or there's bare soil, we'll mulch instead of just leaving bare soil. It also helps prevent weeds because I don't like weeding either. So um, it just saves another job. But what do you mulch with? Um, so any kind of natural material. Um, so greens and browns, basically uh, grass clippings, wood chippings, um, bark, straw, cardboard, carpet, um, newspaper, anything that's going to trap the light from the soil. As soon as you get light on the soil, you'll get weeds, if there's nothing else there. Is newspaper okay to print? Why? Yeah. Stuff, All links are vegetable based now. Right. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, it's more natural than using something like mm. plastic. I mean, you know, it, it, of course, we could go into the realms of what's in every material, but uh, yeah, generally something that's kind of compostable. When you, when you say carpet, presumably woodland carpets rather than nylon carpets? Yeah, although I've seen traditional carpets used, um, they do biodegrade to some extent, and then of course you can swap them out, um, because of course you're dealing with the tea slips and glues. So, uh, uh, you know, sometimes it comes down to personal preference. Um, so I mentioned about ecosystems. I love this picture. This is taken somewhere around Oxford. Um, so this is just an example of, of nature growing in a polyculture, really. So no one manages this. There's a pathway that goes through. Um, you've got trees and you've got shrubs and you've got lower plants all growing together. Uh, so that's exactly what we try and replicate when we're growing food. And this is an example. So this is the Three Sisters. Probably heard of that. So it's sweet corn, climbing beans, and then squash or courgette that are all growing together. I don't know how well you can see it, but obviously the, clip, the, the beans are climbing. That's the sweet corn leaf there. And then these are all courgette, uh, so low growing. They're so quite tightly planted. Very, yeah. 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 Um, so that bed is in a raised bed. Once it was planted, it was mulched with straw. It wasn't weeded once for the whole season of, of um, planting. To be honest, it was a few years ago, I can't remember how much it was watered, but I can tell you that if a, if a bed is mulched, it reduces watering needs by at least 50%. So in terms of our kind of climate impact of producing food, something like that is way more efficient, and it's saving you time. Yeah. Sorry, so on the sweet corn, how yeah. close are you planting those? Are you just planting, um, so you're planting them slightly further apart so you get your jets in, kind of thing? Yeah, know? sure. So, right. I mean, you know, if you had your wig round of, of climbing beans, you can do um, a, a sweet corn in the middle, or you can do round the edge of the frame, and then your courgettes would kind of go in between. But we, we fill out every spare space of soil. Yeah. Because if I don't fill it out, nature will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, we, and, and it, we might not get 300% of plants in there, i.e. full yield of all three plants, but we'll get more than 100% of, of one if we planted one. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the theory. Um, and I've mentioned about mulching already. Uh, I mentioned perennials. There is a wealth of perennial vegetables uh, that we can choose from. I've put a selection of leafy type perennials here. Um, I don't know if you recognise any of them. They all look 
Maybe the same in SEO. Sorrel. Sorrel. Sorrel, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, this one's Sorrel. Which one? No, it's Good King Henry. If you've ever heard of that one. But it can be used like a spinach, so it can be cooked, it can be used in salads. Uh, this is salad vinette, the least taste of cucumber. So I really like it in my salad. So all of these would go into my salads. Um, I don't like lettuce, tomato, and cucumber, I think it's boring. Uh, this is Lovage, it's quite a popular herb. And this is Alexander's. Uh, so that is a tiny, tiny speck of some of the perennials that we grow, but just to give you a flavour of kind of what, what we might grow. And so we grow mixed leaves both for cooking and for salads. Uh, there's lots of root perennials, um, and then there's lots of other, uh, other perennials that we might have heard of, so things like asparagus, rhubarb, blow choke, they all count as perennials because they come back year on year. So do you list somewhere that those perennials? Uh, it's not in the brochure, right. um, but we do run perennial courses. Right. Yeah. Um, we also plant fertility planting, so we're always thinking about feeding the soil instead of kind of bringing in a lot of um, resources or, or using liquid feed or something like that that's brought in or, or manufactured. So all of these plants are plants that feed nitrogen into the soil. And we plant those as part of our garden so that they take nitrogen from the atmosphere and release it through their roots. Um, and they range from small plants like we've got licorice there to huge plants like this is a black locust tree. So they're all, they're all nitrogen fixing. Um, and some of them are shrubs that work in hedgerows like this is autumn olive, this is sea buckthorn, uh, this is an alder tree, and these are um, clovers and vetches. Uh, birds foot trefoil as well, that's a uh, nitrogen fixer. Um, and then comfrey, Penny's had her comfrey outside all day. Um, comfrey isn't a nitrogen fixer, but it's a mineral accumulator. So what it does is it draws minerals to it, itself where it grows, particularly potassium it's really good for. And you can make a liquid feed with potassium, uh, sorry, with, uh, with comfrey, particularly for potassium. So great for fruiting plants. So whenever we plant a fruit tree, we always plant at least one comfrey plant at the, at the base of the fruit tree. Um, so it's just always thinking about building in that ecosystem right at the beginning of the design. Uh, so I mentioned training. So these are the courses that we generally run um, quite regularly. Um, we're going to be starting a farm start programme at Sheep Grove, which is the nearest one to here. Um, but as I say, we work kind of all over the all over the UK, um, and we run regular event bites, uh, sort of master classes, which are free as a sort of gateway for people into growing very very basic levels. So if you're growing food already, they won't be suitable for you, um, but good for people if they want to make a start. Uh, so just to summarise, really, how we grow, I mentioned about not walking on the soil, not digging, we don't have any bare soil, we cover it with a mulch or with plants themselves, uh, we plant in polycultures because the bigger the diversity you have above the ground, the better the diversity you have underneath the ground in terms of fungi and bacteria. We always plant in fertility plantings um, and we always build the soil rather than depleting it because one of our biggest challenges <coughs> for agriculture is the depletion of top topsoil and certainly nutrients. Can I ask about no digging? Yeah. Because I've got chickens and masses of slugs. I don't, I, I generally, I let things grow to about this big before I actually put them out in, yeah. in the wild in my garden. Yeah. Well, I have to dig a hole to put them in. Sure. That doesn't count as, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when I'm talking about no digging, I'm, I'm, I'm meaning we don't turn the soil over um, unless we're kind of planting or well, like pulling up potatoes. Yeah. I always feel guilty because you always disrupt the sure. worm when you take it on. And that's why perennials are really good because you plant them once and they're planted. Right. So that's you know that's that's one of the reasons yeah, yeah. why they're great because then you're not disturbing the soil. And if you keep mulching and keep putting it, does your bed level get higher, or does it all kind of rot not down? really because as it breaks down and decomposes, there's right. a sort of a balance there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We'll know if your house disappears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we see you under a mound of yeah, yeah, that's yeah. too much mulch, Penny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't want to be burying your house. I, I, I try and eat, people laugh at me, but I eat nettles, garlic mustard, and brandelions. Yes. Because they are everywhere in our world, but I wouldn't really eat them. Yes. So Definitely. Um, Have you ever made um, dandelion for Penny? No. That's amazing. So you use the flowers, right. and you boil up the flowers. And then it makes this kind of syrupy thing. People get really cross if you call it honey because obviously it's not come from, from bees. 
but um, yeah, it's, it's a thick, syrupy, honey-like product, and it's amazing. It's lovely on toast. Oh wow! It's, it's super easy. Yeah. Of course, you're taking the flowers from the bee, so yeah. there has to be a balance there. There's plenty in that garden. Yeah. I've never seen a bee on our dandelions. <laughs> We've got lots of stuff. Other than harvesting nettles for soup and other things, how would you get rid of them to make space for other things? Uh, I would harvest them and make tea out of them, so like a liquid feed. Mm -hmm. Basically, because so they're really water rich in nitrogen. Yeah. yeah, stick them in bucket of water, use the water as a concentrate, uh, with, with usually nine parts to one part. So just cut them and just keep cutting them until they don't come back? Yeah, basically, yeah. I'm afraid I've dug up and like, I know you're not meant to, but the, when the roots are so. Well, that, that's the problem, is that they, they do like to sort of spread out and shoot up, and um, yeah. I've, I've got an area of my garden that I'm trying not to mow, but as a result, I end up with loads of nettles in some spots and yeah. it's getting worse and I want to try and do something about it. Just, just keep just chopping them back. Yeah, yeah, it's the be your best thing really, other than digging them up. Okay. At least use them to your advantage. How long do you leave them in the water? So two weeks. Two weeks, right. Same with comfrey. Yeah. Yeah. So you could mix the two if you have comfrey as well. Comfrey so can take over as well, but there's a variety called Bocking 14 which doesn't spread. So when you're, when you're doing nettles, I Cut the very top pair and put to eat for yourself, and the rest of the plant goes to the fertiliser. I've, I've heard you have to do it at a certain time of the year so you don't get stung, or is it just the top that's fine but the bottom is, isn't it? How, how, do you, how, do you, how do you eat it without sort of. Well, you cook it. Okay. Yeah, it needs, it needs you to be very good. Just cook them like spinach. Yeah. And thick ducks. <laughs> yeah. Right, so you make beer around to as well? I so. make beer, yes, yeah. and I forgot to bottle it so it became the cure. <laughs> <laughs> I like the country idea because I've got a, I've planted a few fruit trees, um, but I've just planted them, so I, I might go, and go back and get some more yeah. fruit and add it. But right. just around the base. Just then. yeah, a plant into at the base, brilliant. And you can you can use it as a living mulch as well. So you just chop the leaves off and lay them around the plants. So it's kind of it's cool living mulch, but yeah, it, it effectively as they decompose, they're really seeing their goodness. So if you don't want to go to the realms of making tea, it, it stinks, um, really stinks. Um, <laughs> then you might just want to cut the pieces, but again they're hairy, so just use gloves and do that. Okay. Could you do that with nettles as well? Just yeah. Load of dead nettles. Yeah, there. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing is I've got a lot of, well, a lot of my garden is very wet most yeah. of the time. Um, you said hazel, hazel was good for, for wet ground. Yeah. And that's what for the nuts or. You can grow hazel for the nuts. Yeah. 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 You have to beat the squirrels to it. I don't mind if they have a few. Um, is there anything else that's particularly good, particularly fruit trees or, or sort of nut trees, or anything good that's good for yep. wet soil? Yeah, so um, quince, quince trees and uh, red currants all love wet feet. Um, and then you can do things like cranberry. cranberry yeah. Oh, sorry, cranberry. cranberry yeah. Um, and lingonberry, which is the fruit that IKEA make their jam from with the meatballs, if you've ever had that. Yeah. That's lingonberry. Um, so they, they're all sort of bog party type things. <laughs> Um, also blueberry, um, like damp conditions. It's funny, isn't it? Because hazel, because nuts and stuff, it used to be quite a source of protein, didn't it? And, but now it's just gone, isn't it? And it's, yeah. uh, it's, uh, it should come back, really. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yes, it, it, sweet chestnuts outweigh potatoes and white rice for calories. You know, double. Um, fantastic food. There's a fantastic sweet chestnut at the back of our house, it's two doors down, so they don't afford it. Oh. <laughs> So if you don't want a, um, a, a brochure, uh, that's our website if you want to have a look. Um, but yeah, so we run regular courses and things if, if you're interested in learning more. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take any other questions. Thank you very much. I presume, I, I get the impression that most of you are growing, I know you're growing some things, but you sound like you are, you're growing a bit. Uh, not really, we did make a bit of an effort because we thought we got a greenhouse when we bought our house yeah. and, and it, we, you, we did grow some stuff for one year and then it just it became too difficult to find the time to look after it and yeah. do everything else. Um, so I'm more interested in, I've got a couple of fairly mature, I've got a couple of apple trees and pear trees which are very productive. Um, but they're in the drier part of the garden. I'd like to put more fruit trees in, but I didn't know what would survive. Yeah. And I've, I've put a 
put a walnut tree in, but I've put it in a raised, I've made a raised bed to give it a chance to get established before it reaches yeah. the really wet soil. Will the walnut survive? Is that survive the winter without cover? It's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 we're about yeah. six foot in a year, and uh, over the winter it seems to be budding again quite nicely. We've got a yeah, yeah, a lot of bearing Yes. Almond tree. Well, we have to cover it. We double cover it. Fine. Yeah. I've got a. We've big just put an old tree. And I'm worried it's going to grow over a little bit. Can we? Can we do it for a bit? But up against my fence. Can we prove it to size? It's meant to be the best thing you can do. It doesn't generally like being around other trees. Yeah. So I guess it's okay to cut off other trees. West facing fences. Near it. Yeah. But that takes kind of 10 or 12 years. So you've got some time. And, and grow your own, is, it tastes better. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Just, there were two conversations about walnut trees going on. And, and do they grow quite quickly, then, walnut trees? No. No, they do. They do. <laughs> you said you grew six foot in a It grew from, from that to, uh, from, from that sort of height when I planted it. It, it. it was in a, yeah, I just, I brought a whip that was that size. I put it in a pot for a year or two, and then I planted it out in a, raised bed at that height and over the last over last year's summer it went up oh, to God. over six foot. And um, have you had a, a nut from it? No, 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 not at all. It's, it's still a tiny, tiny little thing, it's, but it's tall but it's not yeah. bushy yet. <laughs>